Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Nash. I'm a historian and a professor at East Tennessee State University. I'm also the president of the Mountain History and Culture Group. We are a support board for the Zebulon B. Vance Birthplace State Historic Site in Weaverville, North Carolina. It's in that capacity that I am bringing you today another episode in our web series, Quarantined Historians Maybe or Maybe Not Drinking Coffee. Today, our guest is going to be historian Bruce Stewart, who is a professor of history at Appalachian State University, which for those of you who are following along in my version, makes this something of a trend. I promise not something that will continue all the way through, but when people are doing good work, uh, we like to bring them to you as best we can. The book that we're gonna talk about today uh, with uh, Professor Stewart is a book called uh, Redemption from Tyranny, Herman Husband's American Revolution. This is a new book by Professor Stewart uh, talking about uh, often discussed and in fact often taught individual uh, in American history courses. I know I talk about Herman Husband pretty much every semester in my introductory history classes. And yet, I don't know that I ever fully understood Herman Husband. Uh, so today we're gonna to talk with Professor Stewart uh, about his new book, Redemption from Tyranny and Herman Husband. And for those of you who are interested in the book, it is available now uh, for purchase from a variety of different sources. Uh, it was published by the University of Virginia Press. And if you're interested in Bruce Stewart's work, he is the author editor of about a half dozen or so books. Uh, he has a Facebook page right here. Easily enough to remember, www.facebook.com slash Bruce Stewart Historian. Uh, so thank you for joining me, uh, Bruce. Nice Thanks to see you. Thanks for uh, inviting me to talk. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know if you saw the first one where we talked about uh, Chuck and Browning and Timothy Silver's book on environmental history of the Civil War. And Kimberly Floyd, the site manager uh, at Vance, has done a couple of these as well, which have been uh, uh, really quite interesting. And in one of them, she actually outed me as drinking more coffee than anybody that she actually knows. So, uh, and, and the irony in that was the first time around, I wasn't drinking coffee. So I made sure that this time around I would be representing. Well, now you're going to make me self-conscious about. Yeah, drinking. about the amount of times. Well, I mean, so be it. I hear you at one, one, one. There you go. That's the last one you get for a while. So with that, let's go ahead and talk about Herman Husband. And um, I think for starters, for our listeners and our viewers, I think what we'd like to first establishes just who was Herman Husband and what made you interested in writing this biography of him? All right. Um, I'll be very brief on kind of describing who he is. I think maybe some of the questions later on, we'll, we'll get to know Herman Husband just a little bit better. So I'll just kind of touch up on some of the major events um, that, that he participated in. Uh, but Herman Husband was uh, born in 1724. Uh, he dies in 1795. Um, he is uh, a white man. Um, he was a farmer, um, I would argue an evangelical, um, and also a political activist. And it turns out that he actually is going to participate in several of the most important protest movements. Um, in 18th century um, America. Um, those were really just four of them. I'll go ahead and just tell you what they were. The Great Awakening um, in, the, in the 1730s, the 1740s. Uh, the North Carolina Regulation, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, in greater detail um, here in a few minutes. Um, North Carolina Regulation takes place in the Piedmont of North Carolina in the late 1760s. He actually is uh, uh, the figurehead. He's a spokesperson um, for that uh, former protest movement. Um, after the North Carolina regulation, um, he actually has a price on his head and he's ultimately going to flee to Western Pennsylvania um, in the early 1770s, um, is going to become a patriot um, during the American Revolution. So he's going to support uh, the American Revolution. Um, in the 1780s, um, he's ultimately going to become uh, what's called an anti-federalist. Um, he's ultimately going to be opposed to uh, the U.S. Constitution, um, the emergence of this new federal government led by uh, George Washington, um, and his disappointment with the U.S. Constitution, his disappointment with the direction 
of the New Republic after the American Revolution is ultimately going to drive him into the fourth movement that he participates in, uh, which is the Whiskey Rebellion um, in um, southwestern Pennsylvania and other parts of, of the uh, of, of the back country. Um, he's actually going to be singled out by Alexander Hamilton, by George Washington. Um, and one of the first people that they actually arrest amongst the whiskey rebels is going to be Herman husband. Um, in 1794, he's going to be um, in prison. He's going to be taken to Philadelphia. He's eventually going to be acquitted for sedition. Uh, but by this time, he's 70 years old. Um, he's released from jail. He's leaving Pennsylvania, um, Phil excuse me, Philadelphia. Uh, Pennsylvania, and he decides to drop dead um, before he makes it back to um, Western Pennsylvania. But, 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 with, but with husband, what, what I found fascinating with him is that he lives what I, during what I call the long American Revolution. He allows us to look at these, these various movements. Um, he really lives through an, an exciting time. I mean, he, he lives through, again, one of some of the biggest moments in um, 18th century um, American history. Uh, why I became interested in him, um, I am from North Carolina. Um, um, so most people that are familiar with North Carolina history, they know the North Carolina regulators, and they kind of know that this Quaker by the name of Herman Husband was uh, kind of a leader, kind of a spokesman for that um, agrarian um, um, protest movement. Um, so I knew about him, you know, in college when I took my North Carolina history class. Um, I ran across him again, though, when I was writing my dissertation. Um, back in the early 2000s. Uh, my dissertation was on um, illicit, moon, or illicit distilling moonshining in Western North Carolina during the 19th um, century. So I had to read a lot about the Whiskey Rebellion. And I discovered, uh, I read a book about the Whiskey Rebellion, and I saw this name Herman Husband come up. And I was like, what the heck? So you have this guy in the 1760s who's part of the North Carolina Regulator Movement, which in essence was the largest agrarian uprising in colonial American history. 30 years later in the 17, early 1790s, he pops up again and he's participating in the Whiskey Rebellion, which is in this case, a rebellion of, of people in Western uh, Pennsylvania against this time, George Washington against the, uh, um, the federal government. So that really got me interested in, wow, why? Uh, this, this guy has lived an, an interesting life. Mm -hmm. and, but I put it aside though. And I waited 10 more years when I finally got done my dissertation, that became a book. Um, and for some reason, I just thought about Herman Husband again. I was looking for a second project, my next, uh, my next book. And I was just curious as to, has anybody written about this guy? And fortunately, I mean, there's a lot of articles on him. He's there every time there's a book on the North Carolina regulation, he's always part of it. But there, the only biography that's published by him was published in 1940. Um, and there's also a dissertation that's unpublished that was um, written in 1982. I was like, oh, my God, I found something that no one really has done yet. Right. Um, so that's why I really kind of got interested in, 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 in choosing um, Herman Husband. Uh, what can you tell us about the North Carolina regulators uh, and sort of their place within sort of 18th century American rural protest groups? Mm -hmm. your, your question really is not only about the North Carolina regulators, but placing them within the larger context. Mm -hmm. And uh, the North Carolina regulation is the largest agrarian protest movement um, before the American Revolution in the American colonies. Um, but it's not the only one. Um, it turns out that before the American Revolution, there are a number of what I'll call agrarian protest movements. You can call them rural mm -hmm. you know, protest movements. Um, um, that take place um, through throughout the entire American colonies. Um, i just give you a couple examples. 1730s, uh, the 1740s in New Jersey. Um, New Jersey, it turns out, uh, a lot of the land was owned by the proprietors of, of New Jersey in the 1730s to 1740s. A lot of farmers, a lot of people that were squatters on these lands, a lot of people that were tenants on these lands, really get pissed off because they want to um, actually own land. Um, so they're actually going to begin to protest against these proprietors. Um, similar thing happens in the 1740s, 1750s um, in New York, in the Hudson Valley region. Um, there you have these uh, manor lords, uh, these, these uh, um, in many cases, absentee landowners that own thousands upon thousands of acres of land. Turns out that there's people living on that land. Those people in the end say, actually, we're the ones that should, uh, we're the ones actually growing things on this land, making it a value we should actually uh, have possession 
um, of this land. So they also are going to protest, uh, in essence, trying to get land from these manor lords. Um, there's another one uh, that's in the early 1770s, so right before the American Revolution, um, in what is now the state of Vermont, uh, where some farmers there um, are protesting, um, confronting these claims of absentee ownerships, um, 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 absentee landowners um, from New York, basically saying, no, this is our land. I don't care what legally, if this legally, this is your land, we are the ones that are actually living on here. Um, so for me, the North Carolina regulation is just one of many of these agrarian kind of protest movements um, that are emerging in um, the United States, or I guess the American colonies before the American Revolution. And, and to kind of get into the North Carolina regulation, what I was struck by was a lot of similarities um, between these um, uh, between these groups. They really place an emphasis on owning land. For them, land ownership is the key to ultimately gaining economic independence. So without actually owning that property, owning that land, in the end, you can't support yourself, you can't support um, your family, you can't uh, make money, which also means you're gonna be dependent on somebody else. And, and for these uh, 18th century Americans, if you're dependent on somebody else, you in essence are what they would literally call a slave. You're enslaved. You're not economically um, independent. So you can see from all the North Carolina regulator, one, one, one of the reasons why you have that, that protest movement in North Carolina is that a lot of these farmers in the Piedmont of North Carolina, what is now um, um, Alamance County, um, Orange County of North Carolina, Randolph um, County, North Carolina, Hanson County, North Carolina, uh, they want access. They want to become landowners. Mm -hmm. Um, in many occasions, the problem is, is that you have these large absentee landowners um, that are, uh, have, have purchased tens of thousands of acres of land um, in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Um, and these people that are moving into the Piedmont, they want this land. Again, they want this to become economically um, independent. Um, they are basically, you know, no, I'll, I'm sorry that you own this land, but you're not here. We're here. We're going to build a barn here. We're going to build a fence. We're going to clean out the land, we're going to cultivate crops. Uh, we should have this land, it should be um, um, ours. So there's this belief um, really, not only in the North Carolina regulator movement, but also these other movements of uh, that, those who should, who are the rightful owners of that land might not necessarily have legal title to that land, but they're the individuals who by their own labor are making that land, um, or making improvements on that land. In essence, what they're doing is they're making that land valuable. Hmm. It's because of their labor that allows them to ultimately say, actually, I own this land. I'm the one that's making it valuable through these um, improvements. So that's another kind of a uh, um, theme. Also about not only gaining access to land, but they're also protesting, they being the North Carolina regulators, um, these farmers, predominantly farmers in, in the Piedmont of North Carolina, they're also protesting local corruption um, hmm. as well. Uh, one thing that I was struck by when I was uh, writing this book and really reading about the regulators is a lot of people, when they think of the back country, I um, mean, in, in the Piedmont, North Carolina at this time in the 1750s, the 1760s is the back country mm -hmm. of the American um, colonies. And there's this, kind of this myth that, you know, this is it's this egalitarian place. Mm -hmm. It's this place where everybody owns land and everybody's self-sufficient farmers. They don't have to worry about debt. You know, everybody's holding hands, you know, they're having a good time. Right. Not the case. Mm -hmm. um, not the case. It turns out that a lot of these farmers, A, are not only have access to land, uh, they're also becoming heavily in debt. Um, and that's, they're not self-sufficient. They need to buy goods that they can't produce at home. Um, they need money. There's a shortage of money in the backcountry. So what a lot of these farmers have to do is they have to loan, uh, take out loans. Um, and mostly the people that had the capital in this society lived in towns and they were merchants. So in essence, these merchants are gonna become creditors and these farmers are gonna become um, debtors. They're gonna have to take these loans out. Um, <clears throat> the problem though is, is that you're only one harvest away from not being able to make up those, uh, to pay back that loan. Uh, when that happens, and this increasingly happens as we get into the mid 1760s, that creditor is going to more than likely sue you for debt to try to, you know, get that money back that, that they loaned um, to you. Um, so you'd go to county court and you'd be sued. Um, unfortunately, in many cases for those farmers who's getting sued for debts, um, 
the merchants were in league with a lot of these county officials. In many, in many cases, the merchants and the county officials were the same people. Um, so oftentimes, um, you as the debtor would lose in court. And by losing in court, uh, you would in essence have to give up your land to these, uh, to your creditors. But what they're also angry about though is how really the political system is geared towards um, assisting the creditor um, in this land. So, so they're arguing about a lot less local corruption. These, these, the county courts, these creditors are corrupt. They're, they're in essence enslaving us by taking away um, our profit, our, our, our property. Um, so a lot of the, I, I would argue that the main reason why you have this North Carolina regulation is this, this disappointment in the, this, the, the North Carolina backcountry as not being this egalitarian place. Uh, again, a lot of these people moved to the backcountry in the 1750s wanting land, wanting that economic independence. By the late 1760s, um, that's not the case, and they're angry. Mm-hmm. And those grievances ultimately lead them to, um, in essence, try to force, um, in this case, Governor William Tryon, who's the governor uh, during the North County regulation, to, to um, you know, to, uh, to address their demands. Mm-hmm. And he ultimately, he does a little bit, but in the end, he doesn't. And that's also going to lead to, in 1771, what's known as the ballot battle of elements, uh, mm-hmm. where William Tryon and North Carolina militiamen, and I'm going to stress North Carolina militiamen, uh, right there, and that they're not British troops. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to meet around 2,000 uh, protesters, regulators, um, uh, near the Great Alamance um, Creek. Um, and there, William Tryon's forces are going to defeat um, um, the regulators uh, again in, in, in 1771. Um, husband, of course, getting back to Herman Husband, um, mm-hmm. he actually flees um, the battle before it actually occurs, and he's ultimately right. going to make his way to. Um, southwestern Pennsylvania. Right. Husband's often sort of portrayed as sort of the leader, right? Mm. You referred to him earlier as the spokesman, more or less, for the regulators. Like, how does husband fit in here? Because I guess one of the things, as again, somebody who has just sort of a passing understanding of husband, that one of the things that sort of jumped out at me when I read your book was how much land he actually owned um, and the fact that in some ways he doesn't fit the profile of the small landowner, right? So like, how, do, how does Herman Husband fit within the profile of the average regulator? Um, yeah, well, it, well, go ahead. One, one thing with the, the regulators is you really can't, there are large uh, landowners like Husband that are part of it. There are squatters mm-hmm. who are part of the regulation. There are these so-called yeoman farmer um, who's part of it. So it's really hard to, um, just by looking at how much land they own or if they own land kind of, seeing exactly who's your typical um, regulator. And it, it's a question I always thought about myself too. Is him, he, really, he's one of the wealthiest guys in, the, mm-hmm. in Orange County. He owns a couple thousand owns, acres, you know, right? He owns 10,000 acres. <laughs> right. And that's something that I struggled with. I was like, well, how is he, um, you know, at the one end, he is kind of the elite. At the other hand, though, he's ultimately for the little man. So maybe, mm-hmm. maybe it's like, you know, FDR in the 1930s or something mm-hmm. like that, or um, their new deal. But here's what I ultimately discovered, and, and it, that he ultimately viewed himself as being what he calls the common farmer. Mm-hmm. Um, even, despite all of his wealth, despite of all of his uh, land ownings, and this is something that's, that holds true after the American Revolution, after he leaves North Carolina, mm-hmm. is he views himself as just a simple yeoman farmer. Mm-hmm a man that just wants to own land and really just enjoy the fruits of, of his labor. Right. Um, so I, he identifies, even though someone might say, well, you own 10,000 acres of land. He's like, well, in the end, what I ultimately am is a common farmer, just like these other individuals. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that links him with these individuals is that he, he considers those people as himself as being what he called, um, uh, you know, the industrious part of the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, the people that are actually laboring, uh, the laboring, what would uh, some people call the laboring many um, during that period of time. The laboring many would be those people who are actually through their labor. Uh, as a farmer, for instance, through your labor, you're improving that land. You're making that land something that's tangible in, in its value. Mm-hmm. Um, another member of the laboring many would be like artisans who are actually producing, you know, crafts, something that's tangible, that this is something that I'm creating that is of, of value. I'm creating property by mm-hmm. 
by creating this um, basket or whatever um, um, it might be. So what else we come up with this is really Herman Husband represents, um, I would argue his ideas are representative of what other kind of ordinary white men at that time, particularly agrarians believed that white society was divided into two groups. Um, on the one hand, you have the laboring many, and mm -hmm. I kind of already defined that laboring many. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you also have though was what um, Herman would call, Herman husband would call men of unworking callings. Um, but what I call the unworking few, mm -hmm. um, people like lawyers, people like absentee landowners, uh, people later on in the 1780s, like bond speculators who make their living off the labor of other people. Mm -hmm. So hence the, un, the unworking um, right. few. So there's this kind of this, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't call it class in the book and I really don't call it class. That opens up a whole nother can of worms, whether or not, I do think that they, they identify themselves as being a member of the industrious community. Mm -hmm. And husband, despite his wealth, views himself in that line. He does not view himself, in other words, as part of this, this unworking um, um, view. Mm -hmm. so it really gets to the heart of, I think, what Herman Husband argues during the North Carolina regulation and what he argues after when we get into his opposition to the U.S. Constitution, when we get into the um, Whiskey Rebellion is this belief that this unworking few, in essence, are going to, they're growing wealthy off the labor of other people. Um, and the fear is by doing that, they, in essence, are going to be able to accumulate enough wealth. And that accumulation of wealth is also going to lead them to have political power. And with that political power, they are then going to further rig the political system, further rig the economic system to benefit themselves at the expense of that labor in many. Basically, what Herman Husband would say would be to enslave the population, to prevent him, to prevent those other farmers from enjoying the fruits um, um, of their labor. And that, for me, it, it, when we get into North Carolina regulators, when we get into the Whiskey Rebellion, when we get into those other uh, agrarian movements that we were talking about um, a few minutes ago, also Shades Rebellion after the American Revolution, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of it is that animosity um, uh, you know, we're working our butts off on this land. We're improving this land. Uh, we're hardworking yeoman farmers, but at the same time, we're being exploited by these lazy lawyers, mm -hmm. these, these lazy corrupt merchants, these, these lazy absentee um, landowners. So to get back to your question with Herman Husband, you know, there's everybody's full of contradictions. Right. I am, you are. Um, yes, he is a wealthy individual, but I also think he also view himself as identifying as being a member of the industrious community. Right. I um, mean, maybe his, his, um, that he's more educated than say the, the average, you know, farmer at that time. It allows him to become the spokesperson to North Carolina regulation because he can write. Mm -hmm. He's writing these pamphlets. Um, and, and these pamphlets are really what I, what I, like, I think are echoing what people are telling him, mm -hmm. what the, what the role of government should be. I mean, in this case, what government should do is to promote the interest of the labor in many not the interest of the um, unworking few. He ultimately views uh, the land west of the Appalachian Mountains as what he calls the New Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, it's there where this, this new government's going to be created in which the common farmer mm -hmm. is going to be able to own land. The common farmer is going to be able to participate um, in, in the political arena. Um, the common farmer is going to be ultimately able to enjoy the fruits of their, of their labor. How, how, does, how do the regulators fit? within North Carolina's path to the American Revolution. Is, is there a connection there? Tryon's um, crackdown on those, those regulars, particularly after the Battle of Alamance, makes a lot of people who beforehand were not sympathetic to the regulators become sympathetic to the regulators. And you, what you really begin to see, this myth that's really constructed, I would argue, in the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, that these regulators were a part of the American, they were you know, the, the first American patriots um, in many ways, like these people from Boston, they read these stories about how this evil governor, royal governor Tryon is oppressing these people. So in many ways, like, they begin to link the regulator movement with um, kind of their own protest against um, um, the British crown. But in reality, again, those regulators aren't um, at that time advocating for American independence. Again, their main uh, problem is with um, local corruption. 
curious thing about that too is during the American Revolution, a good number of these regulators, maybe the majority, we don't know, mm -hmm. um, actually remain loyalists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the main reason for that is the people that were opposed to them during the North Carolina regulation were the Eastern elite. And guess who the Eastern elite are ultimately going to be? The Patriots. Mm -hmm. So they also view the Eastern elite, the Patriots, those people in Eastern North Carolina who are going to be advocating for independence as the enemy. And mm -hmm. there's some way, wait, wait, these people are suddenly wanting to break free from, from Great Britain because they're being oppressed. Well, what do they do for us five right. years previously? No, no. Um, so again, a lot of these regulators are going to, you know, remain loyalists or neutral um, mm -hmm. during the, um, the American Revolution. Um, but a lot of that myth is created by a lot of Southerners uh, right. who are pissed off because New England is taking claim of we are the, you know, the birthplace of the sure. American Revolution. So they start coming up with, they being the Southerners in, in the 19th century, start coming up with things saying, actually, no, we beat you to the punch. Right. Uh, the Mecklenburg Declaration, for instance, would be a, right. a good example of that. Um, so is the North Carolina regulation, where they could point out, well, actually, no, this whole North Carolina regulation was about American independence. And so we got you beat, you know, Massachusetts, you know, 1771. We were already right. you know, fight, fighting those, those, those red coats. But right. The biggest connection, though, is how those individuals in Massachusetts are able to kind of uh, change, uh, really begin to use the regulator movement as propaganda um, right. to show that, um, you know, this is an example of an evil royal governor oppressing um, a, a good English good English citizens who are only asking for, you know, their, their rights under the English Constitution. Regulators right. highlight the extent to which southern colonies and states were divided uh, during the American Revolution, that there's a lot of division or, you know, somewhat uh, reminiscent of the Civil War and a topic that came up later about people, you know, divided in their loyalties and also just people trying to stay neutral, right? That it, in the southern colonies, there was a lot of that. Uh, in my understanding, right? Especially, so, right? Definitely by 1790, he is saying in the end, the Eastern states, they've become so corrupt. What we ultimately need to do probably is to create, go West and ultimately establish our own new Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, a government that's not going to fall to the pitfalls that this young Republic has. Uh, a government that's ultimately going to cater to the interest of, uh, remember the labor in many particularly after the American Revolution, there is a lot of these Westerners that are starting to kind of view the West as being kind of the, um, the best opportunity to ultimately fulfill what they viewed was the, what was the goal of the American Revolution. And again, for them, and this, is, this goes with Herman Husband, the goal of the American Revolution for them was to create a society in which white men have the opportunity to not only own land, but to also enjoy the fruits of their labor. Mm -hmm. um, he ultimately stresses moderation. Mm -hmm. um, he's really the voice of moderation during the North Carolina regulated movement, um, and also the voice of moderation during the Whiskey um, Rebellion. And that during the North Carolina regulator movement, there's a lot of people that are beginning to advocate for violence to, mm -hmm. to enact change. And he's actually always opposed to that. He's saying, no, what we need to do is to work within the, the existing political system and petition for mm -hmm. change. Um, and he actually, here's something you know, here's, I found a, a little bit of evidence of this is by uh, 1770, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are beginning to lose faith in her and husband and his policy of moderation. Mm -hmm. um, same thing happens during the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, you actually have a faction of these Whiskey Rebels, rebels that want to not only fight physically you know, through violence to the federal government, but also secede from the federal government. But again, he is kind of that voice of moderation. No, 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 guys. What we need to do is petition. The reason why he um, was attracted to the Quakers uh, was nonviolence. Mm -hmm. um, so he also has principles, I think, um, mm -hmm. that he's, so, you know, he's sticking to his principles, but he also has these economic interests um, mm -hmm. that, that as well. I mean, it's the same with, you know, you know, FDR during the New Deal. He's a well rich guy. I mean, is, it, is he just a cynical guy trying to control the the twenty five percent unemployed Americans so they don't revolt against the United States government through that, through that, these New Deal policies? That sounds like that sounds like a future episode of uh, <laughs> quarantine historians, maybe or maybe not but, drinking coffee. Uh, I, I'm kind of like you. I mean, I think there's people are complex. It's just not either sure. or. There's no. these different 
forces combining that that shapes everybody's worldview, and we're also all contradictions. Sure. Um, as well, yeah, he's a rich guy who, at the end, also sympathizes and actually identifies himself as being part of of the common people. Okay, so he's not in Southern Appalachia, but he is up in Western Pennsylvania. He is um, broadly within the greater Appalachian region, and and he puts a tremendous amount of emph- emphasis on the trans Appalachian frontier, right? Like you have that great map from one of his pamphlets towards the end of the book. That's more or less his new Jerusalem. And I, I honestly think that that might be one of my favorite parts of the book is when the guy comes upon husband's house and is like talking to him and it's like, wow, that, yeah. yeah, this guy knows so much about geology and this is really fascinating. And then husband pulls out his map of new Jerusalem. The guy's like, Holy crap, this guy's crazy. I got to get out of here. Cause Albert Gallatin actually called Herman husband, uh, the, the Pennsylvania madman. Um, for, so the educated elite view him, particularly kind of his religious kind of really uh, post millennial kind of views mm-hmm. as being, you know, archaic. Mm-hmm. Um, but the people themselves, um, they're still inspired by um, his religious rhetoric. Um, right. Uh, his right. Actually, I think that's why he's also really appealing. The same way why Thomas Paine's common sense is very appealing to Americans at that time is that he's really able to combine the religious theme with kind of this political theme kind of, combine those two and really make um, whatever cause it is kind of a holy cause. It's not only about, uh, you know, attaining rights, but it's also about creating this new millennium. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's also a, a holy right. um, crusade as well. Right. What is Herman Husband's legacy? Like, what do we, you know, what do we take uh, from his life and, and, and what can we kind of <laughs> look at here? I think his, to, to really summarize what he ultimately believes, what his vision of the new Republic was, mm-hmm. uh, what his vision of American society was, was he was ultimately afraid of great disparities of wealth amongst um, white people. And again, what, let me backtrack. One thing I should talk about is her, what he isn't, mm-hmm. what Herman husband isn't. He is not a feminist. <laughs> he does okay. not believe that, you know, women have this, the right, same rights as men. Mm-hmm. He's a sexist, right? Um, he's also a race, so he's not he's not talking about equality for um, black people. Um, he's also not, for lack of a better word, a socialist. Like he's right. not advocating for the end of you know for communes, for instance. He actually believes in the sanctity of private property. Mm-hmm. So don't think of him as this you know embracing women, embracing African Americans, embracing you know um, socialism. Again, right. socialism's not around, but just. Just for the sake of right. you know, let's use that word right sure. there. He, he, he was an um, enslaver, right? He owned. No, uh, I, 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 in the end, I think he doesn't. He's actually opposed to slavery. Well, was it his father he's, then who was? Uh, his, his, it's his father who's the, okay. um, um, the slaveholder. Right. He's opposed to slavery. Um, in many ways, for a while, a lot of Northerners in the 1850s are opposed to slavery. Sure. Um, not for, you know, the impact that it has on the enslaved. Um, so their opposition isn't because of, you know, sympathy for these African-Americans. They ultimately, he ultimately views slavery as degrading to the white population, that these slaves ultimately prevent, oh, to use his word, industrious white laborers right. from gaining access to land, from gaining right. economic opportunity. So his opposition to slavery is because he thinks that in the end it screws over white society. Right. So really what you're seeing here is economic populism. Right. And to get to this legacy, a lot of Americans, I think, when you think of economic popul- populism, maybe some of the younger kids nowadays, they think of Bernie Sanders. Mm-hmm. Um, or or if, if maybe some of the older people are familiar with you know, history, they might think of the New Deal. Right. The point is, though, is when we think of today, we think about economic populism, we think of it as something that's relatively new mm-hmm. in American society. Right. Um, actually, the roots, and this is what I think Herman Husband shows us, is the roots of economic populism. A lot of things that Bernie Sanders, particularly when I say Bernie Sanders, like his whole, his whole crackdown on kind of this notion of gross inequalities of wealth ultimately lead to a breakdown in um, in government and in society. Um, that's actually around. Right. Actually, if you look at the Northern Carolina Regulator Movement, that's something they're advocating for too. Even before the American Revolution, you have a a group, and I'll argue in the, in the 18th century, a, a, a good portion of that labor and many mm-hmm. adhered to that notion that for a republic to last, we ultimately need a strong, a large kind of yeoman class that's mm-hmm. uh, that's uh, independent economically. Sure. That as such, with your economic independence, you can then 
act politically autonomous. You can follow your own conscience when it comes to deciding political matters. You're not going to be beholden to the interests of some rich guy uh, mm-hmm. because you're working for them or, or something like that. Right, so his right. legacy, for what I see in, in Husband, it, I think it reminds us today that this economic populism is it's 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 not new. I think uh, he's a good symbol too of uh, what I th- consider is the failure of the American Revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, and that a lot of these, I'll keep on, I'll just use the word common farmer. I mean, they, they view the American Revolution as an opportunity to remake the world. I mean, to to create this new world in which they, as the labor and many, have, they're calling the shots. Right. Um, and he's a symbol of the failure in that in the end he gets arrested and he's in a jail cell 70 years old. Uh, but I think it's fitting that he's leaving Philadelphia. He's, he, I think he has pneumonia. He, he falls off his horse. He goes to a tavern. Um, he's, he dies alone, I think. I don't think his, his wife was there mm-hmm. um, and he's buried somewhere in Philadelphia in an un, in unmarked grave. Right. In ways, that's a good symbol of a lot of the, the hopes, a lot of the goals of the common people, of the American revolution. It kind of shows in the end, the failure right. of, of, of them to ultimately succeed in, in, a, in achieving what they viewed was the, the, the goals of, of the American revolution. Right. And in a sense, it's a metaphor for husband within uh, sort of, American history that here's this guy that was a leader of the North Carolina regulation movement. And it was a leader of the whiskey rebellion who, you know, had a, had a pretty, uh, pretty loud voice that he wasn't afraid to use in a number of these events. And uh, in a lot of cases he gets overlooked. I, I think it's uh, one of the blurbs on the book, right? That the world has waited long enough for a, yeah. scholarly biography of Herman Husband. And that's true. I mean, we, we've, he's one of these guys that just was always there. Um, and yeah. now we have, thanks to you, a much better understanding of him and his place within his world. So I think thanks. on that note, uh, I'd like to thank our guest, uh, Bruce Stewart, a professor of history at Appalachian State University and the author of the book, Redemption from Tyranny, Herman Husband's American Revolution. Uh, this is Steve Nash uh, for the Mountain History and Culture Group. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Bruce. I appreciate right. it. Thanks for inviting me. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye.